This is the Boom Tank Business Show. I am Carolyn Cole, your show host and founder of BoomTank.com. Boom Tank is where business success and happiness meet. For nearly two decades, I was a Fortune 100 and Fortune 200 senior company trial attorney. Now I make the case on behalf of your business dreams and happiness, too. If you're looking for more business, personal, or professional success and happiness, this is your show. I can help you create all of that. You deserve to have it all, and you can. Let's go. Hey there, and welcome to episode 81 of the Boom Tank Business Show. Thank you so much for listening. For the summer months, I decided to do something a bit different, and I launched two new live stream shows. You can catch them on facebook.com forward slash the Boom Tank, which is Boom Tank's business page. One is on Tuesdays at high noon Eastern Standard Time, and that is Winning in Business Live, where I feature entrepreneurs, business owners, big business owners, multimillionaire business owners, all types of business owners, and ask them how they are winning in business, winning the game of success and happiness too. On Thursdays, high noon EST on facebook.com forward slash the boom tank, I have my other live stream show and that is, is it me or my business? Which is a question and answer format where we explore the mind of business as well as looking at your business structure to see what's going on there too. I was so excited to have as my debut guest on the winning in business live show, Paul Cullen, and that's spelled C-U-L-L-E-N. Paul was a top rocker with the top legendary band Bad Company in the late 1980s, early 1990s. He was their lead bassist. And it was such a fascinating interview. I asked Paul to come back and do this encore interview. It's a separate interview because the sound quality with the Facebook live stream is just not great. I love this interview because Paul talks about his height of rockerdom and what that was like. And then the downswing after when you leave something like that, which is so understandable. And then how do you transition from being at the top to finding yourself not there in a whole new world where all of that is no longer the same and then what do you do with yourself when you are a musician at heart that's your life next it's a story of reinvention and I love this I love this when we're talking about success and happiness to hear stories about reinvention it's a story of trials it's a story of triumphs and today Paul is now a celebrity personal chef he's a sommelier a guitarist with his brand tune your palate and his business this is a really terrific play on words Paul's kitchen and culinary company culinary of course is spelled c-u-l-l-e-n hyphen a-r-y in addition operating his commercial kitchen business and in-person events and in-home events across the country and he'll even come to Europe he has his own private wine label and is working on national distribution of his own wine he is an upcoming fine food product line to be released and in October 2018 he is offering a fine food land tour in Rome and Tuscany and in 2019 he's taking folks on a fine food cruise to Cuba and his last fine food cruise featured a legendary chef wait to hear the name don't want to give away all the secrets time to get Paul on the show Good morning, Paul. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Carolyn. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we had such a great time last Friday on the live stream. I absolutely loved having you. And for those who don't know, Paul was my debut guest on the Winning in Business live stream show that I'm live streaming for the summer months. I was really honored to have you then, really honored to have you on the show again today. And we're doing this for sound quality because the sound quality off of those live streams is not as good as it can be. So thrilled to have you back one more time. Thanks again for having me. God, we had so much fun that day. My girls that were in the uh, Kitchen Nina and Marie were like, God, the energy was incredible. It still is. I, you know, I watched the replay of that and then there are different comments that have come through and everybody loved it. And please give my very best and a big hug and thanks back to uh, Marie and Nina. They were terrific. Team Cullen, as we call you. That's right. I sure will. I'll be seeing them today. All right, so let's dive back into this for those who didn't catch the live stream because you're just such a compelling guest. I just had to have you back on. I'm so glad you, you came. The beginning for you with Bad Company, and everybody wants to know what it's like to be a rocker, so I want to get there, but I want to start at the beginning when you're younger, and this is well before your Bad Company days. You told me you did not pick up a musical instrument until the age of 20, which is amazing, and for those who don't know, you play not only bass, but you play the guitar too, right? Yeah, I switched to guitar uh, later in life in the the, uh, well, I, yeah, in the uh, like 2005, 2006. Okay. So you pick up the bass at age 20 without having picked up a musical instrument before because you were into athletics, you were a sports guy. Why did you pick up the bass at age 20? Well, I had a friend uh, who I met at a party and he's still a great friend of mine. So that was in uh, 1980. 
uh, Stacy said uh, he he, uh, he was a guitar player, and he said, uh, you know, I know you want to learn how to play guitar because uh, you know that's what you asked me. He said, but I'm telling you, I think you need to play bass because there's not a lot of bass players, and there's really not a lot of good bass players. And uh, and I and I thank God I, I believed in him and uh, and did what he said, and I I went out the next day and bought a bass guitar. And when you bought that bass guitar and you're thinking about working with your parents' dry cleaning business versus the bass guitar, what was going on as best you can remember in your mind at that time? Well, that, that was one of the reasons I picked up uh, bass guitar or, or got into music is because I helped my parents open a dry cleaning business in Lehigh Acres, Florida, which is near Fort Myers. And for two years, uh, I, I we worked really hard, built the business up. You know, I, and I loved working with my parents and, and, and helping them build the business. And, and then... But I knew I didn't want to be in the dry cleaning business. So I had a chance to kind of sit back and say, what do I want to do in life? And I was a big music fan. So that's where the whole idea to become a musician uh, came to. And then, uh, you know, then after picking up bass, uh, and I, you know, I practiced really hard, you know, and I, in, within six months, I was playing in a country band making $350 a week, which was more than I was making uh, – doing the dry cleaning business. <laughs> okay. And then when you, when you did that, did you see for yourself a future in music? I mean, you knew right then you had transitioned into being a musician. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because, uh, the accolades I got right off the bat were like, Oh my God, you've only been playing for six months or, uh, the next band I played in. Oh, you've only been playing for a year. In fact, some people wouldn't even audition me because I'd only been playing for a year and a half, you know, or something like that. The accomplishment there, that seems to be like your hallmark. You seem to excel when you dig into something in a big way. So let's keep going with that. You played in for different bands for the next 10 years, wherever you could get a gig, state to state to state, worked very hard. And tell us about those years and what success and happiness was for you in those years as a traveling musician, basically. Well, it was great. I mean, from the time I started playing bass uh, when I was 20 years old, within the first three years, I had played in three or four different bands. And I ended up in Alaska playing in a band called The, Cl the Kids. And, uh, it, and that was such a great experience. It was seven guys went out out west from Tupelo, Mississippi. And, uh, and, and we played in Montana and Idaho and Washington. And then they uh, flew us to Alaska where we played for three months. It was such a great time in my life. And uh, in fact, I, I still got great friends from that band, including uh, my, uh, my buddy Mick Wick, who actually works for Tim McGraw. But one of our things we would love to do, and, and this was so great for being out in, in the Northwest, was to ski. So we would ski all day, take a nap, play rock and roll all night and get up in the morning and then ski all day. And uh, it was such a great experience. I, I can remember smiling every day for, for those couple of years. Why do you think you smiled every day? What was making you smile every day? You've just described it, but what really was it? Well, we were making really good money and playing these big rock clubs. So back in the 80s, there was big rock clubs, uh, rock clubs, in, you know, 300 people, 500 people, you know, and the, and the uh, club owners, mo for the most case, were cool. And they would uh, put you up in uh, a band house. And, oh, my God, it was everything that we imagined, like almost being a rock star would be. You know, they treated us so good. Alaska, we played the same bar in Anchorage for three months, uh, six nights a week five sets a night and and you think we would it, it was grueling yes but but in the meantime we were having a, we were young too so we were having a blast and you know we created great friendships from that time period that's amazing and then your big moment comes with bad company how did that unfold well, after playing uh, 10 years, wherever I could with whatever band I could play with, and I played in an all-black band. I was the only white guy. I played in a country band. I played in a show band where we had three front singers, and it was like a Vegas show band with explosions and all kinds of stuff. So I did whatever I could because I knew starting at 20 years old that I needed to play every day, you know, and I needed to play under a professional situation. So what happened is I got back to Fort Myers, Florida after, uh, you know, a trek all over the country. And my good friend, Michael had a band, uh, in, uh, called the boys of summer and he needed a bass player. So I came back to Fort Myers to join that band. And that band ended up being one of the most successful, uh, sort of, uh, original bands that I ever played in because, uh, on the local rock station, 97 rock, they were playing our original song called little black book. So the band was wildly popular in the Fort Myers area. Um, we played six nights, seven nights a week uh, in different places all over southwest Florida and, um, and sometimes over on the East Coast, too. 
But what happened is the um, as we were playing, we've got this huge following. We started opening up for uh, you know bands that the radio station was bringing in, like Molly Hatchet and Ario Speedwagon and Sticks and whoever. And we would be the opening band because we were the local band with a uh, you know with a song being played on the radio. So uh, so in, in, while that was happening, we uh, we met the uh, the singer and the bass player from ACDC and the singer from Bad Company because they lived in Fort Myers at one time. In fact, two of them, two out of the three still live in Fort Myers. <laughs> and uh, we got to be really good friends uh, with the band because they, they would come out and see us play. On, on a, any given night, The you know uh, Brian Johnson, the singer from ACDC, would show up at this dive bar called The Reef in Fort Myers Beach. And I love he would that sit name. With <laughs> it just sounds like a great dive bar name. That's great. I know. So, you know, I got in that circle of people because uh, they loved our band and they would bring their friends in. So we met all kinds of cool people because, you know, they they would come out and see our band. We were like the only band that they would come out and see and they would sit in and have fun. And so once I got in that group of, uh, of musicians, then then that's when the bad company opportunity came up. What in your mind was your end game? What was your goal in music? Did you want to keep playing with bands? Did you want to strike the big time? What was your plan at that point? When we look at success and how we map it, I'm always curious about what your vision was when you were doing those 10 years on the road, your bigger dream. So when I first started playing in 1980, it was just to work, right? It was just to make a living um, being a musician because of the freedom that you have uh, comparative to a nine to five job. Uh, so we love that. And then all the perks that come with it, of course. And then, you know, as you're moving along, then you get the vibe from everybody else. Like, hey, you know, we need to take this to another level. Uh, you know, the band The Kids was, uh, you know, one of my first big bands I played in. That's the one we went to Alaska, like I said. You know, then we started writing songs and started thinking, hey, maybe we'll get signed. And of course, then, you know, people come into the con into your shows, you know, like in Seattle and go, hey, you know, we'd like to talk to you guys about maybe a record deal or whatever, you know. And, and of course, most of the time that those fell apart and they were you know full of crap but but the point is that we started thinking on that level and i started thinking on that level that i could be on that level so then we started working for that and then personally that's what i started to do i started to work harder even to knowing that maybe i could get on that level and and of course that's the pinnacle of a musician's career is to be on that level when did you crystallize that belief in yourself that you were going for the big time and you could get there that's fascinating you know i don't know when it actually crystallized it was a, it was a uh, a gradual uh, a gradual thing that happened within me, you know, the more confidence I got, you know, of course I was scared. I was very scared when I first got up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching so, that. That's one less thing I have to edit. I love you. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, I was scared, you know, as you are, but you know, when you get up there, then you're like, Oh, wow, this is cool. You mm -hmm. know? And then, <clears throat> you know, as I got on, uh, you know, in my career, further in my career, I would play bigger shows. And then, you know, so like those shows I was talking about, we opened up for Ario Speedwagon stuff. That was, you know, six, two, three, four, five thousand, six thousand people. So then I got that more much more confidence. So when the guys in Bad Company and A C D C saw me, I was I was confident. In fact, there's a video that somebody just shared recently on my timeline. It was uh, Brent was my keyboard player, and uh, and I'm watching this song, Little Black Book, the the original song that we had, and we were playing a bar in Fort Myers, and I watched myself and I went, no wonder they asked me to play in the band because damn, I was good. Oh, that's <laughs> you great. Know, you forget it after, you know, I'm not thinking what I was like in, in 1989, you know, I know right. what I'm like now, but it, it was, it was really enlightening and really fun to see me play. Of course I had, you know, long flowing black hair, which, you know, was cool too, but. Uh, <laughs> but the concept, I, <laughs> and for those who don't know, Paul no longer has long flowing black hair. He has beautiful, beautiful yep. hair now, but it's shorter. Yeah, sure. I'm just lucky I have hair. That's all. I'm yeah, you have lots of hair. You have a great head of hair. I love your haircut. I love your hair. Okay, let's also talk. This is important for success, too, especially in those years where you're out there really starting. Okay, you're making it happen. You're it's it's the struggle and then it's the success, although you jumped into success within six months fairly soon as far as pay. But did you have naysayers along the way who said, Paul, drop the guitar, get back to the dry cleaners, get back to a job, look for your future before the bad company? opportunity came did they say you know you're you're basically playing your life away did you have any of that in your life uh yeah my dad <laughs> okay so, so tell, tell me about dad but to the extent you want to how did you how did you manage that how did you balance that how did you push past that what was that like you know dad was great you know and and uh but he was and he always had you know uh, you know, he was always concerned about me and, and he had, you know, uh, my best interests were, were, was what he thought, you know? So, so he was very disappointed. You know, my mom was like, 
go do it. You know, my mom was my my biggest fan, right? Like, go do it, do whatever we have, do whatever you have to do. We'll be okay, you know. And uh, but my dad was like, well, you know, I don't know if this is a good decision, you know. So so all that time, you know, uh, ten years, you know, my dad was always, well, you know, that's nice, you got to do this, but what are you gonna do? How are you gonna, you know, are you gonna retire? You know, what are you gonna retire on? And, and whatever. And 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 you know, my my awesome brother. I only have one brother. He's, he's an officer in the Navy. So my dad just thought that he took the right career path, you know, which he did take a great career path. Uh, but for me, um, the, the, the light bulb went on with my dad was when he saw me play in front of 12,000 people in Fort Myers, the first time when I, when I came, uh, with, uh, when I was with bad company, the first time I went back to Fort Myers, my dad saw me and he looked at me and he said, yeah, you got a real job now or whatever, you know? So yeah, I had that. And it was at the highest level, my dad. <laughs> Sounds like you navigated that one pretty well. And, you know, you can understand his thinking because isn't that the basic yin and yang of entrepreneurship? Should I stay or should I go? You know, it's, it's that question of, you know, the world pulls you towards the steady income, the routine, the steady check, something that doesn't have the freedom, but your spirit always calls you to the freedom. And that's, that's the, the pull, isn't it? That always the great test about which way you're going to go. Yeah, for sure. And I, I never wavered on that. Once once I jumped in and started playing, because for one thing, I was able to make a living. You know, some of the bands I played in, they were they were bands put together by friends. And then when that band broke up, they're like, No, I don't want to play anymore. I'm this this was our baby. I'm like, hell with that. I'm like, I'm off to that <laughs> band. You know what I mean? I I I somehow I, I'm not sure how I knew it, but I, I I just knew that I needed to keep playing, you know, because I was so behind everybody else that had been playing since they were 10, 11, 12 years old. So I just said, I'm going off to the next band. And, and I had this great uh, manager slash agent, uh, Ted Scorman from Orlando, and he's still got a thriving business. Uh, he's the band. He's the, the agent that booked us out West and in, uh, into uh, Alaska and Montana, Idaho, Washington. And I always kept in touch with him. And if I ever called him and said, Hey, Ted, I need, uh, you know, I need a gig. He'd say, okay, I got this band, join them in uh, Sioux city, Iowa in two weeks, you know, and I would be like, okay, cool. I'm there. How, and so, how did that he, happen? Was there like a bass player flu? I mean, how did you, <laughs> how did you just find all these bass playing opportunities week to week or month to month? That's incredible. My, yeah. My friend Stacy was, wasn't wrong when he said there's not many bass players out there. And then some, somehow, I don't know, I guess, I, I don't know why, but every band or most bands I was in, uh, you know, I, I'm, they, they looked at me as the trust, trusting one and they, they gave me the job of taking care of the money, you know? So I joined the kids and then two weeks later, like, oh yeah, by the way, we're going to let you know that you're in charge of the money. So you get paid and then you pay everybody else and you pay the bills and all that. I'm like, hey, where did that come from? <laughs> So bad company now comes. All right. Bad company comes knocking because the, the lead singer has seen you play and loves you. Now the band says, we want you to join. What was that moment like for you? Well, I got a phone call. Uh, I was grocery shopping. Imagine that, knowing what I do now. Uh, I was grocery shopping, and, and a friend of mine, uh, Doreen, was watching my daughter. And I came in with a bag of groceries, you know, and she goes, oh, she goes, the, the singer from Bad Company called. You need to call him back. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, let me get the groceries. It's hot out there. I don't want to leave the groceries out, you know. She was like, no, no, you need to call him now. And, uh, and I said, okay. And then she goes like, no, call him right now. Yeah. You know, so, so I called him and, and I said, uh, Hey, Brian's Paul Cohen. He goes, Hey, Hey mate. He goes, uh, just want to, you know, just want to know if you, you know, maybe would like to, uh, uh, audition for bad company. Cause we're looking for a bass player, you know, in my cool voice, I said, Oh yeah, that'd be great. And then, uh, but I was jumping up and down and looking at Doreen going, I'm going to play in bad company, you know? So it was a really cool, cool moment for, for me and her. Cause she was actually standing there when I got the call you know, or when I talked to Brian. So, uh, yeah. So then within, uh, he said, uh, mate, uh, you need to get a passport if you don't have one and, uh, you need to learn the rest of these songs that you don't know from bad company, you know? So within two weeks from when I got the phone call, I was in London auditioning for bad company. Incredible. You auditioned for bad company and did they give it to you on the spot? Did they call you back in a few days? How's that work? story too so overnight flight i couldn't sleep of course right going to london and uh, neither could anybody around me because I, I was so jazzed up about it and uh in fact there was two couples that were right on each side of me on the plane because i was in the middle on those uh in the aisle or i mean in the center of the plane and uh um i i kept them up all night basically so they said man if you get this <laughs> 
you better call us and let us know. And uh, so the funny story is, is that I got the job. I called them uh, when I got the job. And I one was from like, I don't know, Minnesota and one was from Alabama. Uh, so when I came through town with Bad Company, I got them tickets and passes. Oh, so it was a, it, I kept them up all night, but I think it was worth it because they were so jazzed that I that I got uh, got them tickets and they got to go to the concert and meet everybody also. Oh, so uh so yeah, when I when I flew over there and uh, it, I didn't sleep and like I said, and then I got to the hotel around ten in the morning. I just kind of laid there and went, okay, I'm in I'm in London. I'm going to audition for Bad Company, and then the phone rings. It says I'm relaxing, and then we'll be there at eleven to pick you up. I like, oh my god, I haven't been to bed yet, you know. So I think it kind of worked to my advantage. And uh, so they picked me up in a limo, and I'm thinking, oh man, we're going to go to this really posh studio and rehearse we were in like the worst part of west london that you could be in <laughs> gated you know with guards and everything and we went in uh, and uh and they dropped me off and, and the guys were already there and i hadn't met the original members yet so uh so i went in there and met mick and simon and and they all very welcoming and they had a bass there for me and uh and basically we started playing right away we played uh, feel like making love and can't get enough of your love we rocked it, and then we went to the pub, which is in the very front of the rehearsal place. And uh, and on the way, uh, oh, there we went up and had a pint of beer. So what I found out later is you had, you play two songs and you have a pint of beer. <laughs> that's that's how they practice there. And uh, on the way back to go, you know, walking back to the rehearsal place, uh, Simon Kirk said, "Hey, what'd you think?" And I'm looking at him like, "What do you mean?" And it was awesome. He goes, no, would you like to play in the band? I said, yeah, I'd love that. He goes, in my cool voice, I said, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then he goes, well, you got the gig. I'm like, oh, my God, I haven't even been in London for like four hours, and I've got the gig. And then what did that feel like? What oh, was my that God. Like I was for you? Like, of course, he had to tell me when we're walking back to play more songs. So I'm thinking the whole time I'm playing the next two songs is like, who am I going to call first and who am I calling next? And of course, it was my mom was first. And mm -hmm. uh, and then I called. I think I even called people I didn't know. You know, it's like, hey, I got the gig. But, you know, everybody was expecting because it was a big deal in Fort Myers. You know, it was in the paper. Paul Cullen goes to audition for Bad Company. And God, thank God for social media back then. We didn't have it back then. It would have been all over everything, you know, so uh but yeah, it was, it was amazing. I, I called the people, you know, I, I think I dropped $200 in, in pounds, you know, calling people, uh, you know, my next visit to the pub. So it, it was incredible. I, I think for at least the first, well, for the first month, it was so surreal. I would wake up and go, wow, I'm, I'm in bad company. What happened? You know, I was <laughs> I'll bet playing. bad company, I'll legendary band, legendary yeah. So I was playing at the reef in Fort Myers Beach, you know, a month ago. And here I am in London meeting, you know, David Gilmore and Boy George and just like hanging out with really cool people, you know. So it was it's surreal as I, I, I probably I could use that term over and over again, but that's exactly what it was. So I was going to ask you when we did our live stream, are you really bad company? And I know you're not, but I was going to do that. But I'm going to ask you now, just for the rock star piece of it, what was it like being a rock star? You, you know, now you're in and for the next number of years, you're playing all over the world to very large audiences. The hits are there. What was that like? Well, it was, you know, it was incredible. I, I can't even explain it. I, maybe you can hear the excitement in my voice, but to be on that level, um, it was just incredible because all of a sudden the money was there, six figures, you know, which was in 1990. That's a lot of money. Um, you know, I got up to six figures, uh, you know, the respect that you get, the uh, admiration, you know, from your peers and your family and everybody, you know, it, it was just incredible. And then and then you get to go up and play in front of anywhere from six to 16,000 people every night. And and it was a, it was a just a, a joy every day. We, we hung out together and we partied together. We had a, a great tour bus that was kind of like our moving hotel room. And, you know, it's, it's funny though. I do, I do tell this story, you know, when, when you're making money like that and you're on that level, you get everything for free, right? Your equipment, your strings, clothes, hats, whatever. And then when you're a struggling musician, you got to pay for everything, you know, which is really bizarre sort of way that, that, that works. But, uh, but if I could just sum it up in one word, it would be incredible. And what I'm hearing in your voice, and it comes through loud and clear, is just the freedom was the, the success and happiness for you, even up to this point, is the freedom that comes with it. And you loved your life. You were free in your life. That was success and happiness for you at that time. Do you agree with that or would you add to it or take away from that? What do you think? No, no, no. It was it was great. I mean, I you know, it, 
every moment. Uh, one of the things that they say, and I think I said this, uh, you know, on, on, when we did the live show, is that the worst thing about getting on a tour bus at the beginning of the tour is getting off at the end because – you know, in that it's another family that you have, you know, and we're all together in this and, and, and we get to see the country and the world together and we get to experience these amazing times. And, uh, and, you know, and then when you, when you're done, it's like, Oh, wow, this kind of sucks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> even if we took like a month break, I wasn't ready. I didn't, I was, you know, I was only 30 years old, 32, or, you know, somewhere in there, you know, I was still young and, and I almost didn't want to take a break, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, I, the, it was just incredible that whole, that whole time period. And then bad company, everybody starts doing different things and then you leave bad company and then it comes the big transition time. And we talked about this pre-chat. We talked about this on Friday during the live stream that this is the time people face in their lives and they may face it once or twice or maybe more where everything just changes and you have to adjust. So now you've gone from the top and bad company and you're facing another reinvention. You are now no longer touring, doing those things. You're not with bad company. You've moved on they've moved on different people have regrouped and done different things what does that look like for you now this time period had to be incredibly difficult had to be very hard yeah i mean you know everybody has those times in life where you're you're you know at the top of your game and i and i think being a musician um you know an actor or uh, an artist of some sort um an athlete you know you make it to the top of your profession the pinnacle and then it's not there anymore it, it really you know it really um really not fun. <laughs> Good word for it. It sucks. Uh, but you know, when, when you hit bottom like that, I think that's when you do some soul searching and, and, uh, and, and, you know, it took me a while, you know, I moved back to Buffalo. I got a divorce, which was kind of already in play before bad company. I finally ended that part of my life, which was the beginning of my coming back up again, you know, of the reinvention, you know, I, I needed to get rid of that negativity. And, um, you know, then I came uh, to Delaware on vacation 17 years ago. And while I was here, uh, I met a, a wonderful lady named Bonnie, which is my wife now. Um, and, you know, things got gradually better. I, I started, you know, feeling better about myself. And, and I think the changing point really came in 2006 when I put down my bass after 26 years of playing and and, and I fiddle around on, on guitar and uh, maybe, you know, wrote some parts of songs, never finished them. And, and in 2006, I made a conscious effort to put down my bass, play guitar like like I did when I first learned bass all the time and write songs. And, and in 2007, I released my first solo CD of only my songs, 10 songs. And the album's called Dream Dance, uh, which I just last year, just it was my 10 year anniversary on that. And now I have five solo CDs out. Uh, but that was kind of the beginning. Like, OK, now I've taken control of my career. When you're a bass player, you don't have control of it because you're going by what everybody else wants, you know, and, uh, and if they need one or, or, you know, you, you so it's kind of, you know, you're kind of stuck there, you know, now guitar, I can do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it in, in that sort of, you know, that that's what became that once I started playing guitar, I could play gigs if I wanted to, I could record more CDs if I wanted to. So taking control of my career, that's when that started in 2006. Yeah, that's so important because that control over your career is what gives you that freedom again, right? Yeah, for sure. And I didn't have that, you know, so, you know, so that's, that's when everything else kind of came into play. My love for, for food and wine, you know, the wine started in bad company because um, Mick Rouse, the guitar player, loved French wines. And that's where I learned about really good French wines, including my favorite Chateau de Pop. Um, so that started back then. But then when I switched to guitar, I got this idea to do like, um, uh, I got this idea to do these events called Unplugged and Uncorked with my friends who had vineyards, one in, uh, Michael and David Vineyard in, uh, in uh, uh, Lodi, California. They have a, a wine called Seven Deadly Zins. I became friends with David of Michael and David just because I had his wine and I emailed him and told him I loved it. We became that's friends. That's a very and popular a wine, Paul. That's that's a really popular wine. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the first one you mentioned, ice. the first one you mentioned, that's the big red of all reds. So interesting. Oh. Very good. So you, now you're moving in wine circles. Well done. Yeah. So it's a, an awesome. Luckily, my friends all have good wines. <laughs> yes, fact, very good. I, that's what I said. If you can be my friend, you better have good wine. Uh, no, but uh, so I started these uh, these events called Unplugged and Uncorked, where I played music, guitar music, which is what I do. You know, Latin jazzy, 
versions of bad company, my own stuff. And then the winemaker would be there pouring wine and talk about his wine. So it was called Unplugged and Uncorked. That was kind of my first sort of entrepreneurial idea, you know, like, hey, I can combine music and wine together, you know, and then I decided to do my own wine. And uh, through friends out in California, I, I ran across a great vineyard called Dry Town Cellars, and they bottled uh, my wine for me out there with my label on it. And, uh, and that was, uh, about eight years ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, like 2000, I'm sorry, uh, let's say 2010. And, um, and I went all over the country promoting it and I had a blast. People loved it. It was a great business model, except I didn't have enough money to sustain the beginning of the company, you know, and I didn't know how that was going to work, but I found out after a couple of years, not very well, uh, because as I found out, you know, me at the end game, making 10% of the, you know, dollar uh, that was being made that, um, you know, that that didn't cut all my expenses running around the work of the country promoting my wine. You know, all I did was just dove in and said, OK, I'm going to do this. And, you know, I went to Palm Springs, California. I was in Chicago, down in Florida. You know, I was at North Carolina, Harris Teeter grocery stores in North Carolina. They carried my wine in uh, Harris Teeter grocery stores. On a Sunday, I'd be playing guitar in the wine shop in Harris Teeter. And people would be like, what the hell is that? And they'd come over and my salesperson would be talking about me and my past. And all of a sudden I was selling, you know, 10, 12, 15 cases of wine at a time. You know, so um, that so that parlayed into that. And then when the wine business ended, then the whole in-home dining thing started. We are in Delaware, Paul and I, a few miles from the Atlantic Ocean. We're on the eastern seaboard of the United States and Delaware. For those outside of the country, it's about a three hour drive to New York City. It's about an hour and 45 minutes from Philadelphia. It's close to Washington, D.C., about two and a half hours out. So we're on the eastern seaboard. And Paul is a star in this area, a legend in this area and actually the tri-state area because we're so close to the Atlantic Ocean, and it's a beautiful resort community here, the beach community of Rehoboth Beach in Lewis, Delaware. So that's where Paul is now. That's where I live now. And that's where this is starting to take shape. So I just wanted to set the stage for that. You told me you came to this beach area on vacation. A friend of yours who you used to play with said, come down, visit. You'll love it. You came and visited on the last night here. That's when you met Bonnie, the last night of your vacation. And then you moved here and, and life took off from you from that point. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and it, his name is Michael Daisy. So he's an original uh, uh, from originally from Lewis. Uh, his parents uh, had a house like three blocks from the Dairy Queen in Lewis. And he's the band. He's the drummer. Uh, actually, he started Boys of Summer, the band I went from to go to um, Bad Company. So, uh, you know, we've known each other. I think I met him before I started playing bass. And then four years later, I was playing in his progressive rock band. And it was funny. He was they were one of the one of the people are like, oh, no, he's only been playing for a couple of years. You know, I don't know if he can play Yes and Genesis and Rush and all this stuff. And I went in and just killed the audition. They're looking at me like, dude, what's up with that? You just came in and played, you know, a Rush song that nobody in this area can play. You know, so <laughs> so, anyway, so Michael is the reason that I came to Lewis on vacation. And that's where I met Bonnie on the last night of my vacation. Right. So now your life, you're putting your life together. It's the reinvention. You've done the wine thing. And that's really impressive. And that's very entrepreneurial, right? You just needed more runway. So you still now have your wine line. You're having, you had the label redone. We showed it on the live stream. So you still have your wine line. The business that you envisioned didn't, didn't work out the way you wanted, but you have your wine line and you're promoting it now, right now as we speak. You now tap into food and you were raised with food, big kitchen, big eats, things like that. Just the eating was wonderful. And now you're looking at, hmm, what can I do here to build this business for a reinvention? Take us from there. Where did you start your business after the wine? You started doing the in-home dining events. And for people who don't know, in 2013, Paul had two in-home dining events. And by the year 2017, last year, he had 203 in-home dining events. And those are in-home dining events across the country. You said Napa Valley, you said Chicago. So across the country, he'll fly to your home. They'll perform in your home and he takes care of the food because you do fine foods and now you are a fine food entrepreneur and a culinary expert. Tell us how you got to the stage you are today. Well, after the wine business ended, you know, I was playing music again. I, I became the wedding guitar player because I play like nylon string, really kind of pretty jazzy stuff and and I and that and I got known as that which is really good money that that might be my retirement job when I just have to show up for 45 minutes and play guitar uh, which then I became an officiant but don't tell anybody that we won't tell the soul <laughs> no neither will the listeners very good 
Yeah, shh, shh. But um, while I was doing that, um, I love cooking, and I have since I was 10 years old. You know, my mom is full-blooded Italian. Talia Fado is her last name. So uh, I've been making, you know, ravioli since I was 10, 9, 10 years old. And uh, so I was cooking here at the house. I had friends over for dinner. I loved doing that. I had like eight or 10 people over for dinner one night in 2013. And the one guy brought me to the side. He said, hey, can you do this for a surprise dinner for my, my wife's birthday next month? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And he said, bring your guitar. I'm like, Hmm. Well, if I bring my guitar, then I'm gonna have to charge you. You know, just kidding with him, of course. But, um, but he, you know, he paid me anyways. And I went into the house. I, I whipped up some fresh pasta and a bolognese sauce and a nice salad and some appetizers and and then uh, and brought some really cool Italian wines that I knew of. Um, and he, uh, they had, they loved it. I mean, they were like, oh my. And oh, then I played a concert afterwards. Of course, I sang her happy birthday and, you know, and then uh, I was on the radio the next uh, day or two and uh, in, in Ocean City on Ocean uh, 98, uh, 98 one in Ocean City, which is where Secrets is. And uh, and they, they asked me what I did the other night or, or last night or whatever. And they and I said, well, I cook for people. I poured some wine and played music. And they're like, really? That sounds awesome. So I explained a little bit more of what I did. And the owner of the radio station, who owns Secrets, uh, Leighton Moore and Rebecca, um, they called me and said, hey, we're having a, a dinner party at the house and we'd love for you to do what you just did, you know, for 10 people. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I can do that. That's really cool. So I charged him what I thought was fair. And he said I didn't charge him enough. So he tipped me double or 100 percent of what I charged him, which was awesome. But the cool part about that was is that he didn't tell me at the time uh, until I got there that – Eight of the 10 people were either CIA graduates or Johnson and Whale graduates, which are the holy grail of school for food, you know. And uh, so anyways, I, I kicked it that night and uh, and had a blast. And then it was just it just happened. Then once that that night happened, I was on the radio again. And of course, they wanted to know because, you know, they knew I was doing it, you know, for their boss. And uh, and then it just took off, you know, without any advertising at all. It's all it was all word of mouth. And we talked about this, that you basically, I'm going to call it a black belt. You have a black belt in wine, right? You're certified. You're one of the rare people to reach a certain level of certification. Yeah. Yeah. I'm second level sommelier. Um, you know, it's not all the way to the top, but uh, but I don't have time to do that or I would do that. But it, it, to get up that high, you, you need to dedicate yourself solely to wine. So now I'm studying under a master Italian sommelier and uh, Marco. And what we do is uh, it, on Skype, we do, uh, uh, I'm like an understudy. So he teaches me on Skype and uh, and mainly we're working on food and wine pairings and how the science of that actually works. So so I'm always learning. And in fact, I'm going to the Italian Culinary Institute in uh, in September for a two week boot camp in uh, the bottom uh, of the boot in Italy, uh, in Calabria. So uh, so I'm always learning. And, and I love that, you know, and, and it's nice to have the title under your name, but it's really nice to have the knowledge of what you're doing. What you're doing is you're actually applying it. For you, winning in business was, one, going back to something you were passionate about, and you decided to put the bass down. You decided to pick up the guitar so you would have more freedom and control over your life, which actually gives you the freedom. And then you met Bonnie, and you loved the area, and you're like, what can I do here? And you started these in-home dining things because you went back to your skill set, your magic, and you tapped into more magic, which was the food background that you had, and people loved it. Now you see an income coming. You have this rebound effect where you're restaging another reinvention to now position yourself for rich business success. And I love this story because you kept going with this. Then the in-home dining events grew. And then you had a, a very popular cruise with a renowned chef. Who was that? And tell us about that. That was really chef good. Dr. Pond. So, yeah, in, in the midst of everything that I've been doing in the last, uh, you know, uh, 10 years since I switched over to guitar, uh, we host vacations. Uh, in fact, in October, we're taking people to Tuscany for five days and then Rome for three days. And it's a group tour. So I'm kind of, I'm the group leader for sure. And, uh, and our uh, uh, accent on travel, Annette Stellhorn, uh, she puts everything together. We, we get together, we put it together ourselves, and then she does all the logistics for us. So, so one of our trips, uh, we've done three Oceana cruises in the Mediterranean, and the last one we did was Venice to Rome with Chef Jacques Papin. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he was uh, great friends with Julia Child, and they used to have a cooking show together. 
And uh, he oversees all the restaurants on Oceana Cruises. So he actually has a, 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 a restaurant called Jacques, a uh, beautiful French restaurant on the cruise line. So, uh, yeah, so somehow I wove a net into my into what I do also. And that's that's been hugely successful. We just took 31 people to the Caribbean on a tall sailing ship uh, uh, last March, um, which was just totally amazing. So it's great. And that's building my captive audience and my brand by doing these kind of tours, uh, especially when we go to Italy and uh, and they get to experience what I've already done. And uh, and then through the people that I know in Italy. So it's it's not like a, a Pirello tour where it's, it's pretty touristy. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing if you've never been, but I can take you places that you would never go, you know, which is to me, that's what the brand we're trying to build with that. And you are. You're doing the land tour this coming October. You're also in 2019 going back to the cruise ship. Am I right about that? Yeah, this is really exciting. I, I've been wanting to go to Cuba for a long time. Uh, and uh, the Oceana Cruise people uh threw it out there you know uh just a little while back that we could do a group tour to cuba and at least from miami and we only go to cuba so we're in uh havana for two nights then we go around uh the bottom part of cuba and uh and we're in santiago one night and then another port another night in fact that's thanksgiving of 2019 we'll be in santiago uh leaving port and having thanksgiving dinner together as a group on the ship and this is one of oceana's uh, boutique smaller ships and there's only 690 people on the whole ship. We're going to talk about how they can find you when we close out here. I'll also have a link to you and your events in the show notes over at boomtank.com for this episode. This all sounds terrific. You've got your new commercial kitchen, and that's where we did the live stream show last Friday from your commercial kitchen, which was very exciting. You're doing food product lines for people, and you're going to be unveiling that fine food product line. You're also doing some catering for very large events here. You've got your cruises. You've got your food land tours. You've got your your in-home dining events, you've got your wine line. So all of that is very ambitious and it's pointing you towards an amazing brand, as you say, right? It's building the brand, growing the business for a multi-million dollar success. That's where you're at least pointed and that's where you want to go. With all of this, what do you think is your key right now to winning in business, Paul? I'm driven. I always have been, you know, other than that little bit of time after bad company when I didn't know what to do. Once I have a path and once I have an idea and, and especially, of course, when it starts making, you know, creating revenue, you know, that's that's what's driving everything now is that, you know, my in-home, in-home dining is creating a, a, a beautiful revenue, beautiful revenue for me to be able to do these other things, you know, so that's something that I won't quit doing. Well, I love doing it anyways, but that's driving it. Now I'm able with a captive audience now, you know, because of cooking for over 2000 people last year, 1800 people the year before, you know, that <clears throat> I've got this captive audience. So, you know, people that I've talked to, and in fact, my friend, uh, uh, Greg David, he owns uh, George's Bloody Mary mix. And he, he started that Bloody Mary mix uh, the same time I started my first wine label from California eight years ago. And he did the right thing. He stayed working until until uh, George's Bloody Mary mix started making him money and he could actually leave his job. But he's done a fantastic job and he's always going, dude, when are you doing your own products? When you've got captive audience, you know, so he's always driving me like and I see his success. He's all over D.C. And, and Giant and Harris Teeter stores, and he's killing it. So he's very proud that I'm uh, you know, um, going to be having my own product line. And for me, I needed a commercial kitchen, which was what we were looking for for the last two years. And we finally found the right kitchen that's not attached to a restaurant or a, a retail shop. You know, so my my lease is very manageable, you know, where – you know, I was looking at one place in, in Milton and it was, you know, $30,000 lease a year. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to put myself in that position again. And I think I learned that from the wine business <laughs> and, and, and thank God, you know, uh, but now I'm putting myself in a position where, you know, we can have products. And I just talked to Pat Kaluzzi from the farmer's market in Rehoboth. And she said, I'd love to have you let me know when you're ready. So that will be probably my first farmer's market that will attend on, on a sporadic biz, uh, basis because I'm not ready to go full time right now. I just want to do it whenever they need me. And that'll allow us to hone in on the product and, and do what we need to do and make sure it's the best of the best. 
That's really interesting. I didn't know Pat was with the farmer's market. So always a good tip here today for me. That's really good because I may be featuring them in the future, the farmer's market, just for, for a nice oh. like local show. Yeah, that's that's really cool, Paul. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, All right. With the, with the success you have now and the happiness, we talked about, okay, where you're going for the winning business. And we, we talked about the power of referral, the power of networking, the power of following your passion, all of those things in the live stream. You said, you know, these are what, these are the things that are making me successful. They're also making me very happy because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. On a scale of one to 10, we'll go through the exercise again. How important is it to network in business? 100. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. On and a scale of one to 10, 100. Right. Uh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, that's, that's how I got where I am. You know, I barely spend any money on advertising at all. I mean, the only thing I do is trade out some dinners for some TV commercials and radio commercials. And that to me, you know, that's, that's a good trade off because, you know, I, I pay minimal for doing a, a dinner for eight people compared to the money I get for the actual commercials. For those struggling out there and they're like, the money hasn't come yet or in that they're in that window of transition where you were, where it wasn't quite right, but they're starting to feel their sea legs and they're starting to see how this can happen for them. What is your advice to them to keep going? I mean, how did you keep going? Because we talked about this earlier. There are certain people you know who made a fall from something like Bad Company. They left and they did something else and they just never recovered and they checked out early. They either went to addiction or they did other things. To avoid all of that, what is your recommendation to them to get through their transition to reach the other side? I guess for me, I, I've always had that ability, even when I'm down, to think of something positive that I could do, you know, and, you know, and I'm not sure, oh, you're not always sure what that is. But I think what happened with me, uh, you know, both times, back company and then where I am now, I followed my passion and, and the idea that I could be successful in that business. And then I did whatever I kind of had to, and that means working hard, you know, um, to get to that position, you know, for me right now, it's, it's the, the, the difficult part is that, okay, so I do music, so I don't have a whole lot of time to play guitar. <laughs> I do wine. I don't have a whole lot of time to, to, to learn about more wines and then I cook. So I don't have as much time. So I got to split my time up to, to learn more about what I'm doing, you know? Uh, but in, in, in the same breath, I'm learning every day, you know? Uh, so I think just stay in, focused on what you think it is that you need to do to be happy and successful. And then you're going to hit a roadblock. So you got to go around that roadblock. Like we were talking about the other day, you hit a wall, you make a right and then you make a left and then you start going forward again. So just stay in the course as much as you can. Of course, it's really hard when it, when it's financial financially troubling and, and hard to do. Um, so you got to do whatever you got to do. You know, I've done a lot of things. I did mortgages. I, I put in decks. I, I drove truck. I mean, I did whatever I could, I guess, to one thing, realize I'm really lucky that I have what I have, which is music uh, to fall back on. But it, it gives you a better appreciation to when this become successful again. You know, I, I couldn't be more appreciative and blessed and, and feel that, you know, all that I went through was all worth it because of where I am today. Oh, that is magical. And then happiness for you now, Paul, versus early in your life. What is happiness for you now? Because we discussed this also that you can have all the success, quote unquote, in the world. But if you don't have happiness, it's worthless for you. What is happiness for you now that meets your success? What is that? I think two things mainly. Uh, one is that, you know, my my home life is awesome. Me and Bonnie have a great relationship. We have two doggies. Th those are our kids because uh, we don't have any kids together. What kind of we doggies? What kind of doggies? We have whippets. I have a, 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 18, a 20 month old whippet uh, puppy, basically. And, uh, and then we have an 11 year old uh, long haired whippet. So they're our babies. And we got them both as puppies. So we've, we've raised them and they're our kids. So for me, uh, you know, sitting out on our screen porch like we did last night and making a, a simple meal on the grill and drinking some wine and listening to music, uh, kind of like what I do for a living. But but I got to do it last night just chilling out. And uh, and, and that's one of my favorite things to do. And, and just being with Bonnie and getting to do the things we get to do together. Uh, that's number one. And, and number two is making people happy. Uh, through all their senses. So when I do an in-home dining event, you know, I, I, I got them with the smell and the taste and, and the, the visual of the dinner and then, and, and, and then the taste of the wines and then the, the listening of the music, you know, and I truly like when, when I'm done with an event, 
I get in my car, no matter how tired I am. And believe me, when I do five in a row, like I'm getting ready to do starting tomorrow, um, I get in the car and go, God, that was great. You know, because of the joy on their faces, because they've never experienced anything like this. I know because nobody does what I do. So I, I've got that on them. Um, and, and then just the joy, they hugging me and they're like, that, this was just amazing, you know, and, and that, that makes me happy and it makes me think I'm on the right path. And speaking of the right path and making others happy, you're philanthropic. You do things locally for charities here, correct? Yeah, I donate dinners. I have since 2014. And uh, yeah, they, you know, at first they brought in okay money and now people know me better. So they bring in big money, you know, any, anywhere for, from, uh, you know, 2200 to $4,500 a dinner I bring in for the nonprofit. So that's been amazing. And and, uh, and, and this certainly isn't bragging. It, it makes me feel good that I've raised over $135,000 uh, in four years for uh, charities throughout the Mid-Atlantic. Just success and happiness and helping others all over the place. I salute you for all of your reinventions in this latest one. Absolutely fabulous. I'm going to have, as I said before, a link for Paul in the show notes over at boomtank.com. Paul, why don't you give the listeners your website address? It's very unique. You're amazing that you captured it. And then I'm going to do a wrap for you. Okay, cool. So the best way to, I mean, if, if, you know, if you don't remember the, ad, uh, the 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 web address, you know, just Google Paul Cullen and Bad Company. I should come up first. <laughs> so, uh, so my actual address is uh, www.paulcullen.rocks. R O C K S. I don't know when they came up with rocks. You know, instead of dot com or dot net or dot org, but I was looking for Paul's Kitchen. You know, which is what we're calling my my new business, my uh, catering kitchen, uh, commercial kitchen. Uh, and I saw dot rocks. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to get that. So I got www. Paul Cullen dot rocks, R O C K S. And just so people know, again, I said this in the introduction, but Paul's brand is Tune Your Palate, and his business is Paul's Kitchen and Culinary. It's a play on words, C-U-L-L-E-N, and then a hyphen A-R-Y company. Please check Paul out. So you've got your wine line, and you're working on the license now to distribute that nationally, which is terrific. You're working on your fine food product line. You have in place the in-home entertaining events where people can contact you, and you'll fly all over the country for those in-home events. And you've got the fine food land tour coming in October in Tuscany and Rome and then the cruise to Cuba in 2019 all terrific things please check out Paul please check out his website please check out those events and support Paul and his good work because in turn he supports others really thrilled to have you on the show today it's been a complete honor again I salute all of your reinventions Paul you have really lived you're still living still accomplishing you found where success meets happiness and again I love to say everyone deserves to have it all and they truly can. Well, I believe you have had it all. You're going to continue having it all because you truly can and you are deserving. Well done. Well, thank you, Carolyn. I really appreciate it, especially coming from you, uh, you know, knowing your background and your reinvention and, and what you're doing too. It means a lot. It's all a journey. So glad to be traveling it with you and so glad you're on the show today. Thanks again, Paul. What a great interview with Paul. He's such a terrific guy. Did you catch that piece when he said he was on a local radio station being interviewed and mentioned that he had just done his first in-home dining event as basically a favor to someone he knew, and it was a blast, which in turn led the radio station's owner to ask Paul to do the same for a dining party of 10 for him, and how that then led to double pay and the beginning of his big and great in-home dining events. The message here, loud and clear. Follow your passion and show up with it. People love Love passion. It's energy and pulls them to you. In Paul's case, it's key to his highly successful reinvented business and happiness. Also, how about Jacques Poupon, the renowned chef featured on one of Paul's fine dining cruises? Amazing. Have to say, I have a signed Julia Child cookbook, signed by Julia, in my kitchen, and it's one of my favorite things. Reinvent your business, life, or career for your success and happiness. Make up your mind and fully go for it. That is a wrap. Take great care. See you back here. Bye for now. Thank you for tuning in to the Boom Tank Business Show. I so appreciate you listening, and you know I do. If you like the show, please leave a five-star rating and some nice comments on iTunes or subscribe on the free podcast listening app Stitcher for Android users or Google Play. And tell a friend. Join Boom Tank's email list at boomtank.com and download your free instant audio training. It's two audio downloads. The first one, 10 top life and business lessons from my expert guests. And the second, a super success meditation you are going to love. Be sure to check out my coaching 
Coaching and Consulting tab on Boomtank.com and the Speaking tab to book me as your next professional speaker or featured guest. Catch my live streams on Boomtank.com or on Boomtank's YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash the Boomtank. Now get out there and create your success and happiness. See you right here next time.